Come on up, team. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Great to be with you. I'm Paul Comfort, uh, the moderator of today's panel. And uh, I think it's going to be fun. We're going to have a good time. Thank you for sticking around for it. We have with us coming up on the stage some uh, renowned experts in the field. And uh, we're going to have an interesting conversation, I think. Uh, first off on the stage is Shin Pei Tai, who is Director of Global Policy for Cities and Transportation at Uber. Uber's become a big part of how public transit agencies now provide total mobility, global mobility. And so we're excited to have her on the panel. Next up to her is David DeCozen, who's Vice President of Business Development at Cubic. Come on up. Are there chairs for everybody? Yeah, come on up. Uh, Jennifer Videz Hirsch, Chief Customer Experience Officer at LA Metro. Let's welcome all three of them. And finally, my buddy Greg Spots, who's Director of Seattle DOT, Department of Transportation. Let's welcome all of them. So the topic of today's conversation is building back ridership. And as you know, that is the topic du jour across our transit world. I was in London last week speaking at a conference, uh, Intelligent Transport Conference there. And uh, I was, we're filming an episode of my TV show, Transit Unplugged TV. And I was interviewing Simon Reed, who is uh, head of TFL, Transport for London's Technology for Surface Transport. And he said, Paul, I'm ready to put 2019 to bed. Uh, we're tired of comparing ourselves, our ridership numbers, et cetera, with that. We're focused on what's coming next. And I think that's a great way to start today's panel, is we're going to talk about, uh, of course, how to build back ridership. It is important. Uh, the politicians who fund us, and I'm a recovering one, so I can say that, uh, they want to know, why should I give you more money next year if you're serving less people? And so we need to answer that question. But I think we can also talk about... Uh, Creating, you know, the old saying, if you build it, they will come. We've got the head of customer experience here from L.A. Metro. Um, we're going to talk about building a safe, efficient, reliable transit system with world-class customer service and how if we focus on um, the key components and putting the customer first, like Stephen Covey taught us, right, and seven habits of highly effective people, begin with the end in mind. What's the end of what we're trying to do? We're going to talk about redefining that. What is the end of what we're trying to do uh, as transit agencies, as people who are involved in the ecosphere of public mobility? Are you ready? Let's get started. All right. All right, so we'll just go down the panel here, and I'll ask each of you to kind of give me a little introduction. And, uh, and in order to make it fun, I think I'm going to ask you one other question. Tell us a little about yourself, what you do, what your role is in ridership perhaps. But also, Greg, why don't you kick us off. The last time I talked to you, you were actually on a bus or getting on a bus from a call we were having. Tell us about your first or your most fun transit experience. Thank you. It's great to be here with you guys um, and back in L.A. So, um, you know, in, I grew up in suburban Connecticut, and uh, the only transportation available if you didn't have a driver's license was a bicycle. And when, um, when I moved to Manhattan in my early 20s, I became like a real subway dork. Like, I wasn't involved in the urban planning or transportation business, but I sort of studied the subway uh, and had all these thoughts about how it worked. And uh, one day they, like, got rid of the token, and they got the new fare media, the Metro card, and it allowed for these um, transfers between subway and bus. There used to be a paper transfer from bus to bus, but there was no free transfer switching from subway to bus. So I start telling my friends, this is so amazing. I can get from the East Village to the Upper West Side by taking the number six subway and then transferring to the bus for free on the 79th Street bus. And my friends were like, you ride the bus? So like, I've been riding the bus my whole life. and. Um, I didn't ride the bus that much in my 24 years living here in LA, but um, since I moved to Seattle in Labor Day, uh, I didn't bring a car, and I've been relying on the bus system. And the bus system in Seattle is excellent, and uh, it's been a really great way to get around and learn the city. That's great. That's Terry White, right? King County Metro, my buddy. Um, so give us one more minute before we go down. What do you do? What's your job as head of the DOT? So I'm running Seattle Department of Transportation, and we manage the roads, sidewalks, traffic signals, uh, markings, and uh, we own a streetcar. Uh, we own like 100 Desire. bridges. What? Is it a streetcar named Desire? We haven't named it that yet. Okay. We're trying to name all three segments the culture connector. Okay. But anyway, um, we, uh, we don't operate transit service, but we work very closely with Sound Transit, who has the light rail, and with King County Transit. And an interesting thing is, 
Seattleites have voted for a tax that produces revenue to support transit, a city tax. So we invest city tax dollars in buying additional transit trips from our transit operators for um, riders who need you know, transit trips that wouldn't normally be provided. So it's very interesting that we're like constantly interacting with the transit operators and even funding them, but we're not an operator ourselves. Very good. And you run a moving bridge. And if you don't move it in time, what happens? There's no groceries in Vancouver? There's no groceries in Alaska if <laughs> our uh, Spokane Street rotating bridge can't rotate and allow cargo heading up the Pacific Northwest. It's wild. That's interesting. All right. Thank you so much, man. That's great, Greg. All right. Jennifer Vidas Hirsch, your Chief Customer Experience Officer at LA Metro, our host city. Tell us a little about yourself and what you do. Hi, I'm uh, Jennifer Vitas. I um, am the, as the Chief Customer Experience Officer at Metro, I'm responsible for, you know, end-to-end, -end ensuring a great experience for folks above uh, aboard LA Metro's uh, system. So that, um, in, in the purview that includes customer care, as well as marketing and communications and community relations, and all of that is in there because the whole point is to um, change the way that we approach talking to customers and interacting with customers and learning about customers um, and doing everything through the customer lens. Uh, we also have a CX group that does market research, customer research, and that manages a, an annual customer experience plan where we actually take input from our customers that we hear from them throughout the year, but also in an annual survey and develop new programs, new ideas, new improvements um, that we can do for the system to make it, to make it better for our customers. And so um, you know, I just started in June uh, I recently, before that, I was at LA uh, at MetroLink, so uh, which is the regional rail across the region. Do you need me to answer the? the yeah. Why don't we talk about your fun transit experience or your first transit experience? My my, my first transit experience was uh, when I was a high school student in San Jose, Costa Rica. I lived in Moravia, and I went to, and I lived. Sorry. I went to school in Moravia and lived in Escazú, and there was four kids, and my mom had to pick, had to travel across town to pick up the kids from this. We were all in the same school, but I wanted to do extracurricular activities, and so I started taking the bus in San Jose. And if you know anything about the geographies, I had to go all the way. It's kind of like going down through LA Union Station, right? I had to go into downtown San Jose, change buses, walk, you know, from one side to the other, and then take another bus all the way back to home. So that was my first experience with public transportation, I um, started taking transit here in LA when I worked, before I was at Metrolink, I worked in public television, and I had to commute to Orange County a lot, and I was driving, and it was soul crushing. It was the worst traffic ever, and so I, I, dis I actually discovered Metrolink and became a Metrolink writer, which then also made me a Metro writer for connections and everything else. Um, and so I just fell in love with the service and fell in love with the impact that public transit can have on people. And so, you know, and now here I am at Metro. So I, it's important stuff we do. It is. And as a former rider who relied on it, you kind of know inside the mind probably already of a rider. I think it's important. Greg's the one that brought it up that we should talk about this, is that we have to talk about our own personal experiences with it. Um, so did you used to sing that song, Do You Know the Way to San Jose? When you <laughs> No. <laughs> okay. It came up a lot. All right. I'm sure it did. All right. Thank you. That's great. And I look forward to, to unpacking a little bit more about what you're doing and, the, and what you're seeing. We just had Stephanie up here who said that ridership is back up to 70%, although we're trying to put 2019 to bed. It still is a, a data point that we can compare to, I think, and so it's important. David uh, DeCozen, who is Vice President of Business Development Cubic, you all are in a lot of the major transit systems uh, across not only here but the, but the world. Matt Cole, your former CEO, is a good buddy of mine uh, who now is over in, I think, is he over in the U.K.? He's in Reston working with oh. Ademio, so. Okay, <laughs> yeah. He hooked me up with, uh, back when I was CEO of MTA in Baltimore, he hooked me up with a guy at TFL, who, uh, Shashi Verma, who was the chief technology officer there. And he took me down. It was, probably was your old gates, Cubic's gates or something. And it was right like six years ago. And um, it's when they went to these tap-and-go credit cards, you know, that, that they're doing all over now where you don't have to have, like, the charm card or the oyster card. And he said that within six months, this was probably in 2016, um, 
that they were at already 40% usage. People, it, it had done that much market penetration. People love the idea of just using a credit card you know, as, as a multi-use card. So tell us a little about what you do at Cubic and, and the role you all play in ensuring uh, what Jennifer's talking about, which is a great customer experience, because getting through the gate is the first part of that customer experience. Well, thanks, Paul. And, and yes, uh, Cubic does deliver these electronic fare systems globally. We've got a very big presence in Australia, the UK, US, et cetera. Um, when you think about it, um, and, and I've been with the company now for, it'll be 31 years in February, wow. so I've seen quite a bit of evolution uh, in terms of how these systems have developed and expanded. They started you know, responding specifically to subways and then multimodal systems for rail, bus, commuter rail, et cetera. Um, it is one element of the passenger experience. Um, but as you said, it is one of the first elements of the experience that the passenger has. And I think as the technology has been advancing, um, it's become more than just about payment. It's about service discovery, journey planning. Um, and as the technology has moved forward and we've moved from card-based fare systems to account-based fare systems, it becomes a lot easier for the system to extend. So transit, as we started to talk about redefinition, uh, transit becomes more than just about rail and bus. It becomes about extended services, whether that's scooters or parking or bike share or other micro mobility modes. How do you pull all this together in an integrated framework? So a lot of what we're doing now is working with our customers globally to you know, solve this problem of how do you bring things together and leverage the sta standards and the technologies that are in place today to bring together this uh, you know, seamless fabric. My role specifically is, uh, you know, we do have a global business. I lead business development for the Western United States, which we define as everything west of Lake Michigan, um, and then also Latin America, which we're you know, exploring and just now starting to get uh, more actively engaged in. Um, my transit story um, was just almost 31 years ago, my first trip back to Washington, D.C. to go knock on uh, the head of operations for Washington Metro and try to sell him this newfangled thing called a contactless smart card, right? Well, you know, the clueless young San Diego guy gets on the, the subway underneath Crystal City, doesn't realize that it's raining, right? And I come up out of the, uh, the station right by the Jackson Graham building and it's pouring. And I'm late for my meeting, and let's just say a drowned rat showed up at the, at the desk for the first intro to the customer. So there you go. But I, I lived there for four years, and um, wow, I mean, it, it, what a great system. And it really, you, you learn the lifestyle of using transit as your main mobile uh, utility. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, WMATA, Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, or as uh, when I worked there for five years, we used to call it, well, MATA really stands for We Meet and Talk a Lot. So, but um, uh, Randy Clark, who came up from Austin, uh, has done an amazing job in the first few months on the job. They just opened the Silver Line last week, which we've been waiting for for years. They were working on that when I was there a while ago. And uh, goes out to Dulles Airport. And I don't know if you saw, but just last week, they started enforcing fares again. Uh, as they were 40, they saw that 40 million dollars they lost last year of uh, with fare evasion, and so uh, they felt like since we have a 180 million dollar hole in our budget for next year, maybe we can do something there. So they are wor working on. I just covered it on my podcast this week. Maybe even changing what the gates look like and putting some. So I don't know if you want to talk about that any later, but putting some barriers on so people can't jump the gates. Those kind of things to make it uh, so it's not so much enforcement; it's preventive uh, in nature. All right, now let's shift a little bit, right? So where are we at in public transportation, by the way? Before I introduce you, I'm, which I want to show the context for Uber and the role that TNCs now play in our global mobility potpourri in all these cities of the various options that are available to us, our cornucopia of options. So public transportation, to give you a little history, I wrote a children's book about public transportation during the pandemic. It was my lockdown project. I wanted something for my grandkids to be able to read a, a picture book about public transit. There was nothing out there, so I wrote one. And uh, thankfully, it went to number one on Amazon and has been sold all over the world. And I learned a lot about the history. So public transportation in the U.S. really got our, you know, in the 1950s and 60s after World War II, 
uh, when it was profitable to run public transit systems, like in Baltimore, where I used to run the system, they were run by private companies, a lot of times by electric companies, because they had the electric catenary wires over top for the streetcars. And then in the 70s, uh, most of them went bankrupt, and electric companies decided we can't make a profit doing this. So the governments took over these transit companies and agencies. They became public agencies. So we've had a pretty good run. Forty years, we've had a monopoly on public mobility in cities. Public transit has. I'm a transit evangelist, so uh, you know it's exciting when you're the only game in town. And then about 10 to 15 years ago, Uber and other companies came into our cities. There was a company called Via that's still around now, and other companies started coming in and saying, no, no, we want to have a private sector response because the needs in cities have changed. Uh, Jarrett Walker, the great uh, transit planner, is actually part two of his, uh, my interview with him from last week is on today's podcast that just dropped, Transit Unplugged, talked about how that he went down to Houston. Remember in 2016 when Tom Lambert, the CEO of Houston, rebooted their entire bus network overnight and, uh, and, and was an electric shock to the heart of transit. Prior to that, we were in a five or six year decline in ridership, the industry was. I remember in 2015, 16, APTA had the CEO summit in Florida and all of us were freaking out, right? Hair on fire. What are we gonna do about ridership? Ridership is down everywhere. Five year decline, you know, it's bad news. Tom Lambert figured it out and they rebooted all the network with Jarrett Walker and other people's helps. And you know, two thirds of the routes weren't going downtown anymore. Now they were, it was a grid pattern. And so in 2017, we saw seven cities adopt that model and 18 more did. And then in 19, across the industry in the US, transit ridership for the first time in a decade saw an increase in overall ridership. And we thought going into 2020, it was gonna be amazing. Well, it was in a different way, right? We had the pandemic hit us in March, and then ridership tanked. And so transit agencies have had an opportunity to reflect. What is our reason to get trial? What's our reason to exist? Is it just about transporting the commuters in the peak of the peak to the big shiny buildings in downtown? Or is there more to what we're trying to do as an agency? And I think we figured out overall that there's more, that we want to take this opportunity to improve the lives of people who are in our cities by providing equity and inclusion to our cities, by cleaning up, by taking responsibility for the environment a little bit more. One of the other things we've decided to do, I think, is if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> and so the, the relative success of TNCs like Uber and Lyft and other companies and the new models of um, electric scooters and bikes and all the new mobility, we've now integrated them. So the reason I gave you that three-minute uh, context is that the role of public transit agencies now has changed. I've talked to 75 CEOs of transit systems over the last few years um, on, on my podcast, and all of them have said it has changed. Pretty much everybody said that. That now we're no longer just a provider of transit. We don't have a monopoly. Now we're an aggregator of all the mobility options in a city. And one of the great mobility options is Uber. And Uber really has become a friend of transit over the last few years. The head of their transit division, um, I had her on the podcast. Jen Shepard. Yeah, Jen Shepard. Uh, my buddy Dmitry Vanjigoff, who I used to work with at Trapeze, is over there now. He looks like ZZ Top. He looks like he's a twin from my son, by the way. Uh, but um, Shinpei works for them now. She is their director of global policy for cities and transportation at Uber. And, man, she's got a story to tell. Tell us about what you guys are doing for across the world to help mobility in cities. Thank you. What an introduction. Really great to be here with all of you. Um, I, I should give all the credit to the transit team. They're really the ones that are leading the charge on co-creating systems um, to complement public transit. So I, I think one of the things to keep in mind is that new mobility will never replace public transit. Uh, but there are ways that it can be deployed to complement, to supplement, to fill gaps, and really make not owning a car part of an urban lifestyle and, um, and really give people a sense of independence. And a bit of a transition to that, I'm actually an urban designer, planner. I got into transportation policy because transportation was such a determining factor for how our cities are shaped. It is a huge piece of how people's everyday lives are um, composed. And, and I was really interested in ways that we could be better at helping people live more fulfilled lives and reach their potential. Um, part of that comes from, I'll just take on that question about my first transit experience. Some of, it, some of it comes from the way I grew up. I grew up in the suburbs of Syracuse on a cul-de-sac. 
And the first time, it was very isolating. Um, it was very frustrating to me that I couldn't walk to visit my friends or go to school or anything because there were no sidewalks. Um, and the first time I took transit was, as an, uh, um, was right after college, and it was completely transformative. The independence and freedom I felt being on transit uh, was really tran was, hu was huge. And I got to travel quite a bit um, at my first job and um, used to spend my time, my free time in these various cities between meetings, taking the bus route from end to end and being so excited about all the different people that we get on the bus and um, really take advantage of that. So I saw a slice of how transit intersects with people's lives that was really meaningful to me. Now I'm at this technology company, so what am I doing there? Um, <laughs> this, so I lead a team that covers um, basically three, three pillars of work. One is um, what we call sustainability, but really it covers like the energy efficiency and space efficiency that's necessary for us to have sustainable cities. And um, as we, we do EV, EV um, electrification, we also look at ways that we can um, help people reduce car dependency. Um, and there's, there's, this is a uh, growing part of the business, so more to come on that side. A second pillar is, is more product oriented. We are looking at all the different ways that people need to rely on a car. A car is a bundled use of many, many different uses, right? It's, it provides for all sorts of different ways that you, the weekend trip, the school run, the grocery run. Um, we're looking at the ways that we can unpack that, unbundle that, and fill those gaps so that maybe a household can give up a second car Maybe you can, you know, have more independence even if you, if you have, you know, have one car. And then the third piece of it goes back to my interest in people-centered cities and human-centered design. Um, it's focused on um, the, what, the small S, small I social impact. Um, so underserved communities, people with disabilities, how do we better serve them? We know that TNCs have been transformative for that population. So my team covers the policy arena for those areas. And on the transit side, I think, it, go to our website, there's a paper there called, um, that is about transit. Uh, um, transit agencies becoming mobility managers, becoming the owners, the, the conductors of all these services, um, while maintaining the frequency of their main systems, but being able to choose and expand their toolkit of all these other services is something that we're really interested in doing. So by way, that's a bit of an introduction to the work that we do. That's great. I love how Uber and other TNCs now have kind of found their niche. Like you said, it's not going to necessarily take the place of the 40-foot bus, right? We're always going to have the need for mass transit. But there are needs for, for other uh, micro transit. Let's use that word. That's an all-inclusive word that our industry is using. And I think companies like yours play an integral role there for first and last mile solutions, like Brad uh, Miller's done down at PSTA. He was one of the first ones to do it in uh, near Tampa, Florida, Clearwater, and others. And there's lots of roles, just like autonomous vehicles, right? Autonomous vehicles are probably not going to take the place of a 40-foot bus anytime soon, but they do play a role. And so I think th we're exploring options of what people need now. And we're focused on what the end customer wants. And that's why, Jennifer, I want to ask you, as the head of customer experience for LA, what do our customers want now? Well, um, according to our most recent sur customer experience survey, um, our customers are concerned about um, reliability and frequency. They want something that they can, they can, they want to know that they can reliably get to where they need to go as frequently as they need to go. Um, but also right now, they're very concerned about safety Security, cleanliness, um, which is an issue that I think we're we're facing across the nation in terms of uh, you know coming out of the pandemic, some challenges that societal challenges that we that we're all facing. So um, safety, cleanliness, and homelessness on our system. And so um, we um, also found in our recent survey that we're we're losing women, right? So women are riding less frequently now. They're you know we know that. Um, women were disproportionately affected by the pandemic, and potentially there's some of it is related to that. But I'm, you know, not going to use that as a, you know, we'd have to do more research to know definitively. But, um, you know, we can speculate that the, the reason why, part of it, the reason why is because of concerns over safety and security. So, and, and that's actually something that we've been working on for years. Um, Metro started a, a, a women and girls uh, committee, you know, within the organization to try to understand 
how women travel and um, you know what are what are the differences and so things like you know they might use the bus in the middle of the day for errands and taking the kids to school and those kinds of things or um, but then also whenever they're traveling they usually have kids and more gear and so we have to make sure that our seating and our buses and stuff like that are you know is really conducive to um, women being able to travel. Um, so you know anyway we we're using these survey surveys to develop customer experience plans. Um, the last one really validated a lot of things that we were already working on. Um, on the safety and security front, we actually had a um, plan that was approved in February that was really a reimagining re of public safety. It included input from customers, input from you know, stakeholders, employees, um, and really it's a layered approach that um, focuses on safety in the more traditional sense. And so what we're talking about is cameras and lighting as well as the, the deployment of security officers and law enforcement to address you know, crime and to address um, uh, code enforcement. But then we also have this, this customer care aspect of security, which is of safety, which is really about there's the whole feeling safe, right? So you're a woman or even just, you know, a lot of people, you're on a system and there's not a whole lot of people around. Maybe you don't, you, maybe you feel a little bit uneasy. Um, and so um, we have a few things going on. One is um, we have some homeless outreach teams that, that go out onto our system and help connect um, the unhoused to services which has been pretty effective we want, and we need to do more, we want to do more. Um, but we also just recently introduced a Metro Ambassador program and this is a pilot program. Um, and we have, so far we've trained about 100 people. Um, they are being recruited um, by our, we have two contractors that are recruiting um, folks, um, being recruited for um, their life experiences and so we're we're looking for life experience and professional experiences with situations like homelessness or crisis intervention and those kinds of things, but also very, very uh, focused on you know, diversity, you know, folks who live in the neighborhoods, folks who, you know, take transit and love it and that sort of a thing. So anyway, they're, they're uh, well-trained and they're outfitted in bright green. So if you go on the metro system, you, s you might see them at LA Union Station or on the, um, the B-Line, but uh, they, and on the new K-Line, but they, they're helping customers. They're helping them, you know, by just being there, being present, saying good morning, which is actually one of those things that people are like, whoa, we have a friendly Metro person saying good morning to me, this is amazing. Um, but then also helping them, you know, pointing where, the, where to go. But they're also tr going across the system and reporting things that they might see. So like if there's a cleanliness issue, right? Or if there's an elevator that's not working, or if there's a situation on a train, they've actually saved lives on the train where they noticed somebody was having a, a problem. They, you know, called for help and saved some lives on the system. So what we're learning is that you know people really want more people on the system um, to to sort of help them, and it, and it's you know part law enforcement obviously, but also really also part this this group of people who are sort of caring, caring about the riders, caring about making sure that uh, we're providing a really good service and making them just feel at ease with what's going on in the system. So it, it's, it's, we're pretty excited about it. We hope to have 300 of them on the system by January. That's great. January. Yeah, you guys are uh, under, you know, under your CEO's leadership and your board. You're doing amazing things uh, to really focus on the customer. I think that's awesome. I want to shift for just a second and talk about the technology that's, uh, that's helping us connect more with our customers. I've been, been blessed to work for a company called Medaxo, the world's largest transit technology company for the last five years. We own a bunch of companies like Trapeze, and Mark Godin is here from there, uh, and Transloc and RouteMatch. We just brought them on board this last year. But um, David, as kind of our technology guru here on the stage, what are customers looking for when it comes to technology? And if you could also address gamification, which is something that I think we need to do more of here in the U.S. Europe's gotten pretty good at it, but we haven't done here. Go ahead, take it away. It's, it's a really interesting question. Um, what we're finding now uh, with mobile technology specifically, um, you know, the, as many of you will know, you, Apple Pay, Google Pay, they use an NFC, near field communications technology embedded in the phone, which is compatible with the transit cards that we use and have been using since you know, the late 90s. Um, we now have the ability to provision, and you, we do this here in Los Angeles and in San Francisco and Washington, you can provision a virtual transit card into your wallet and just tap your phone and manage your whole fare experience right through your app. 
so you can it's basically a ticket vetting machine and a card in one um, and what we're seeing in, interestingly now is as the ridership recovery trend is uh, coming back I think it's the last statistic I saw here, 23% uh, of the tap revenue is now on mobile and growing as, as it comes back. So it's, in, it's an indication that people want to be using these mobile devices. Now, w once you've said that, the mobile device is so much more than a card. It's a uh, interactive communications terminal where you can proactively deliver information to your customer it's a, a device where not only can the customer get fair information, but they can plan a trip, they can, they can uh, get service alerts, they can do a variety of things. And as we go forward, uh, we'll be able to link other services through the app to this multimodal seamless environment that we've been talking about and have that facilitate the, the payment, not just the discovery and the booking of the services. Um, Layer on to that, you've got this uh, interactive terminal that is always connected that somebody just used to uh, facilitate boarding a bus or a train. Now you've got an engagement opportunity with that person and make the actual trip richer um, through gamification, rewards that may come through gamification that could be, um, you know, Take the form of things like transit points or stars. All of these things are opportunities that sit in front of us to enrich the, uh, the customer experience through a, a more powerful engagement tool than a card was. That's good. Thank you. One of the relationships that I didn't really appreciate until I uh, took over the job as CEO of, a, of an agency is the role of a transit agency connected with the city DOT. The people who run the streets who run the traffic lights, like if you want to put in, like we wanted to do transit signal priority in Baltimore when I was there. Of course, we had to work with the city of Baltimore to make that happen in 35 intersections. If we wanted to do bus-only lanes, it wasn't on our streets, it was on your streets. And I had to work with you to do that. I remember William Johnson was the head of the Department of Transportation in Baltimore when I was there. He's gone down now to Fort Worth. Uh, but our relationship was key. For even things like when snow fell, we had to make sure that they didn't scrape their plows uh, too hard over the tracks of our light rail system or they would screw them up and then our light rail wouldn't be able to go down. So all those kind of things, the relationships. Greg, you're head of a DOT in one of America's major cities, Seattle. Tell us about that relationship and how that's helping Terry White and Julie Tim, who now heads up Sound Transit, uh, reach more people and improve ridership. Thank you. Yeah, you know, of all the many things um, that I could be doing uh, running Seattle DOT, I think enriching a the collaborative relationships between the city of Seattle, the county transit operator, King County Metro, who actually uh, provides the operators for all the different transit vehicles, whoever owns them, and Sound Transit, who has the light rail. Those three relationships and, and making those deeply collaborative, I think, is one of the best things I could be spending my time doing as a leader. Um, you know, there's a lot of bread and butter stuff like you know, is there a safe place for people to get on and off the bus? You know, the, the place where they alight, is it, um, is it a concrete sidewalk? Is it, uh, you know, a, a patch of grass? Um, is there, is there um, the right kind of ADA accessibility to that bus stop? That's the basics. Then you get into things like, um, tra you know, traffic signal priority uh, or bus only lanes. But there's some really interesting layers of involvement that are possible. Seattle has a tax where we can spend that money on transit improvements. And we used to um, like buy free ORCA cards for youth. And that was one way we thought we could spend the city taxpayer dollar to enhance transit experience. Well, the county just m took that on for the whole county. So now we have more money and we're trying to figure out, okay, Maybe who else could we subsidize? You know, could we subsidize the residents of Seattle's public housing? Could we give them free transit cards? Um, we're also buying additional trips on established routes off peak nights and weekends to help shift workers. The people, those essential workers in the pandemic who have to be at work physically and probably 
may not be working that traditional nine to five shift. Uh, we've been buying additional trips. It gets really complicated when there's a bus driver shortage regionally. So there's fewer trips, but you're buying additional trips and it's really hard to explain that uh, to consumers. So one thing we're exploring is could we actually fund Metro to try new types of services? Um, here in LA, LADOT operates a dash circulator bus system. And when I used to work here downtown, uh, that dash bus was the best way to get from Public Works building to City Hall. Um, we don't operate any uh, transit services at SDOT, but we could potentially partner uh, to say, hey, here's a service we'd really like to see King County Metro, could you run it for us or could you have one of your contractors run it for us? Up till now, we've more been funding um, additional uh, additional trips. That's good. A lot of cities now uh, coming out of the pandemic have um, realized that uh, you heard uh, Stephanie talk about it today. It's called the Tuesday through Thursday city, uh, meaning that people are riding transit more on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, Thursdays to commute to their jobs in downtown. Mondays and Fridays, not so much. And so they're adjusting routes. They're, they're, they're adjusting the frequency or the headway of these routes uh, to pick up during the peak periods and less on the, on the sides. But and they, as they do that, sometimes there's a danger of some people being disenfranchised. Uh, they're, you know, Aunt Susan has to get to a bridge game on Thursday night is the example I'd like to use. And she likes to ride transit, but now there's no bus route coming down her street because there's just not enough people to justify an articulated bus down that street. That's when the role of microtransit comes in. Uh, microtransit, I think, is a layer on top of the traditional mass transit routes to ensure that, that there is some equity and inclusion. Shinpei, talk to us about the role that Uber plays and other TNCs in doing just that. Sure. Um well, I, I guess what we've been able to do with a few transit agencies is um, help supplement um, trips for riders that are in lower density areas where it's very expensive to run a big full-size bus um, and, and essentially increase access. So one of the best cases for this that we've been working with the Dallas, um, the Dallas Transit Agency for a few years now, they recently expanded the service areas because of the success of this program, is to supplement um, their service, the, their trunk lines with microtransit around the edges. And in doing so, they were able to save jobs and uh, redirect them to the lines that had greater frequency. So there was a net zero loss in the bus driver's um, jobs, and there was increased service um, in their ability to, um, at, at lower costs essentially, especially around the edges. But I, one thing I wanted to point out that I was just reflecting on the three things that, that you, the three of you were talking about and I really appreciated was how much you touch on the experience of riders, especially as they're talking about you know, bringing back the 30% and what the difference we need to make in doing that and just threading a few things you know, removing the friction of that getting into the system, the communications and having a bit of a celebration for um, when someone actually gets in the system and making them feel very valued. And then the, the how much of a public realm experience the whole transit system can be when it's on the streets. Um, so it was just, I, to me, that I think that magic, that magical piece is part of what we also try to bring, you know, as, as Uber the company, right? Uber basically made that experience of getting a ride feel incredible and you could order it on your phone and it showed up and it got you where you needed to go. And I think that's something that we should think about, but across all these different planes, like all these different dimensions of the, the systems, the, you know, maybe it's the, maybe it's the gamification, but also the physical space and also the communications and the celebration of bringing you back into transit, so it was just, it was just, I was just reflecting on that as I was he listening to all of you. I like this idea that every single touch point, either in person or digitally, is either a piece of friction that makes it harder, or something sort of possibly even delightful that makes it better, and and maybe end to end we have to be thinking of it that way. Yeah, yeah. I was just, I mean, I think that like there's so much opportunity for the stations 
even the bus stop, but then also the payment, the payment integration, that's taking that friction away, that when you talk to the transit agency, how important it is, there's so much opportunity. I mean, I, I, would, I would add on to that, and I, you know, I use, my, people on my team hear me say this all the time, I have a focus group of one that is a 19-year-old or 18-year-old who goes to college um, and who very desperately wants to use transit, and he, he uh, but he wants to be able to like just Google it, right? Like when he buys concert t-shirts, he Googles it, and then he uses Google Pay, and he buys his bad t-shirt from Czechoslovakia or something, I don't know. And so packages come in the mail that he just, he just Googled it and found it, and he just, whatever. I, I think we need to get there. Like if we really want, you know, I've been telling my team, we need to get kids on transit before they get the car keys, before, you know. Um, we just some of our conversations and focus groups with kids. We need to make it that easy, and for them to say, "I need to get from point A to point B," and it might be take an Uber from here to here, and then take a train from here to here, and then take a shuttle from there to there. And ultimately, that's where we all need to go. Um, I think really, we're really close to the day being gone where it's even like an a, an app of our own, right? I think it's. We need to make it very openly easy for people to just go from point A to point B. And we're not, and we're not doing that right now. So that's the, the big opportunity. What I've observed also, and I, I use this term a lot, is it, it, the most important word, I think, in mass transit is mass. It's everybody, right? And um, from a technology perspective, what we've got to do is build the most flexible systems that provide the widest variety of ways to access and pay, and those may be two different things, right? Because uh, some, user, some user groups may be free, but you still want to know that they've boarded, right? Um, but access and pay, um, and recognize that, you know, we've got people, we heard at this discussion this morning about these major events. If you go look at what we're doing in New York and Chicago and London, you don't need to go get a card or open an account or do anything, you just tap your credit card, right? Get on, right? Um, but what do you do about a child or a student or how do you manage an institutional program or what do you do with um, if you want a link ticket where somebody is incentivized to ride to the game and then pass through the turnstile at the venue. There's a variety of different technologies that are utilized in university campuses, uh, event venues, uh, et cetera. So we've got to be very flexible to enable all of these things and give our operators the maximum choices of how to set up these programs and partner with other entities. In Seattle, our hockey team had a lot of success this season giving a free ride on the monorail to get to the stadium. And that's embedded in your e-ticket. And that's turned out to be a lot of people have used that. That's awesome. I was at a hotel uh, a few months ago my wife and daughter were with me, and I was out working during the day, and she told me when I got back, you know, Paul, I would have liked to have taken the bus. There's a bus stop right in front of the hotel, but I didn't know when it would come, and I didn't know where it went, so I didn't ride it. And I thought, such a simple comment, you know? And, uh, but one of the ways that people are addressing that, because uh, like I think David said earlier in the green room, we were talking about, you know, this 30% issue. Maybe it's not going to be the same 30%. Maybe it's going to be different people. Maybe we need to figure out uh, how to make it easier to use. The friction you were just talking about, reducing that. One way some transit agencies are doing that now, I think of uh, Palm Tran. Clinton Forrest, my buddy who runs Palm Tran in Florida, Palm Beach, Florida. He's putting UPC symbols on every bus stop in his system. You just put your phone up to it, you, you know, like uh, on your camera, and you can push the, the button, and it'll take you to that bus stop. You're at bus stop, whatever, and the bus comes, you know, every 15 minutes, and it goes from here to there. Just that's, and you can pay with your credit card, or it's $1.50. The basic information we all need to make a decision, right? Who, what, where, when. We know why. I want to get somewhere, but we need to know those other things. And the who is the transit system, but we need a little more information. So what do you think about simple little things like that? Anybody? Well, I, I actually think there's this an amazing time I mean, everyone's been talking about the inflection point and recovery, um, but also this last 30%, there are other huge structural questions right, at play. How are downtowns going to cover? What's gonna happen to commercial real estate? 
what, um, what are the patterns that are emerging? Are they always going to be fragmented moving forward? And they may be. So I think it also goes beyond the transit agency, one, to answer that, to answer that question and to find those partners. But two, one of the things that we've been working on is just thinking about, okay, who, who really re needs to rely on the variety of services right now to move around, just the one point A to point B. And one of the fastest growing areas um, at Uber is frankly the Uber for Business accounts because those people are moving and they're all different kinds of businesses. There's government agencies. We're helping the New York City Department of Education move some kids because they had to pull back some bus routes. And um, maybe it's the district attorneys who are trying to move witnesses. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of movement that are critical to getting the cities back going. I mean, we, are, we need to get out of the shelter in place mentality and get back to the moving. But I think it's also part of creating that place and, and partnering the place partners, the, the, part, the agencies that are thinking about what's going to happen to the downtown, what is going to happen to our economic development um, uh, activities. And, and, and kind of embodying that diversity of activity that's necessary to bring it back and, you know, removing the friction and making that possible. That's great. We've got about five minutes left. I'm going to ask each of you to, in our lightning round here, to give us one last thought, about a minute of a thought, uh, of what you think uh, the future holds for ridership, for transit, and uh, from your pers uh, perspective. Greg? Sure. I, I think that we need to provide lots of options to lots of places as much as 24 hours a day if possible, uh, rather than to just be thinking about a big commute to downtown in the morning and a big you know, return home in the afternoon. You know, Seattle has the second highest percentage of remote work in the country after Washington, D.C. We've got more than 40% of people working remotely. And they say it takes um, six weeks to establish a habit in a human being. Well, it's been two and a half years, so a lot of people are pretty established about doing that. Um, but there's so many other additional uh, places and spaces that people want to go. And uh, we have to make it easy no matter um, what you're trying to do and when and, and how you want to interact with the system or pay for it. That's great. Jennifer? Well, I'd say re reflecting on how our ridership is recovering, it's recovering faster on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, than it is um, during the week. And obviously the off-peak times are doing pretty well as well. So, you know, we're not really, we've, we've sort of already kind of abandoned the, the commute type mentality. And we're looking at things like, you know, a lot of partnerships with um, sporting and entertainment venues. We've actually done some integrated, some partnerships um, uh, with uh, like the LA Kings and, you know, other organizations here in LA. Um, to so that they can they're either promoting or they're actually enabling or their their um, customers to buy a metro ticket to take metro to to um, their sporting events um, and you know leading up to the Olympics obviously this is really going to be important because we want to we want to make sure that we can have a car free Olymp Olympics we recently had a, an event we had a, the LA Coliseum or that area that we had two sporting events on the same day one right after the other which made the the um, uh, MLS Cup game was a car-free situation. Everybody had to take Metro mostly, and and you know we actually did pretty well. So it was a nice, good practice run. But I see those people as people who could, could be, might say like, well, wait a minute, this is much easier than what I was doing before, and you know using those as opportunities to bring people onto the system to, for more things. So that's one of the kinds of things we're looking at. That's great. Thank you, Jennifer. David. I think what you're seeing and what I'm very optimistic will happen is, you know, a lot of these conversations that we've heard today, transit is being both redefined and repositioned. When I say redefined, I really mean it's not just about rail and bus anymore. It's about this integrated fabric of modal services that work in tandem as part of a seamless journey. We're still in the process of making that a reality, but I think that will be a reality. And then through some of the things like what Jennifer was just talking about, repositioning through that, through communications and promotions and programs, resetting the mindset of how people perceive transit. 
and making it more like what we see in Europe, where it's more aspirational. I think as, as the service is enhanced and it is redefined the way we've described, that will happen and ridership will grow. Guess okay. last. <laughs> um, yeah, better. <laughs> I, well, I guess one way I interpret ridership, honestly, is how do we get people back into a system that allows them to have the freedom of not owning a car or depending on a car or having the cost of a car or having to carry a car well, around should with note them. she doesn't have a car. <laughs> I don't have one either. <laughs> um, and I have a small child, so, you know, we managed to figure it out. Um, but, and, and so that's, that's sort of the, the vision I kind of hold when I hear all three of you talk about your respective roles. And, and, the vision, and I'm really excited for a time when we can celebrate that return to a really multimodal um, city where all those different systems, ways of moving around support the place that it is. Um, and I think that we've missed that in the last few years. And so I think with, with Uber, I think it plays a small role, frankly, compared to the public agencies. But I think, but what I would like to leave is that it is, I think, a in a position to partner in a more intelligent um, way to supplement or complement um, and help you reach those goals. And I mean, even with electrification, we're outpacing, the drivers on the platform are outpacing pu general public adoption of EVs because of what we're able to bring to the platform. So just food for thought. It's excellent. We've heard a great summary of uh, ways that transit agencies and the affiliated uh, organizations are helping to improve ridership. If you want to hear more, I'll have some of them as guests on our Transit Unplugged podcast. Every week it comes out. It's free on all uh, podcast platforms. It's number one for transit in the world, heard in 100 countries. I um, encourage you to subscribe to it and uh, also the Transit Unplugged TV show where I go to a different city each month and dive into the food, the culture, and the transit of that city. Denver's the city that's up there right now. It's on YouTube. And finally, I want to offer each of you a gift. Uh, I've just uh, published a new book called uh, Conversations on Equity and Inclusion in Public Transportation. It features conversations with 20 of the world's leading transit experts on how they're improving equity and inclusion, including Terry White. It wrote the final chapter from Seattle. I'm giving away copies at the Transluke booth today, autographed copies at 320. So if you come by and you're one of the first 50 people there, you'll get a free copy of the book. Let's thank them for giving us great input today on improving ridership. Thank you. <laughs>